So in 2007, there was a, a writer strike in Hollywood, which meant that the, the TV networks, they all of a sudden couldn't make any new episodes for their usual TV shows. And so because of that, the networks decided it would be a great idea to create a whole bunch of cheap new reality TV shows. Now, if you secretly like reality TV shows, just keep that to yourself for now. Um, but to be honest, let's just be honest, the vast majority of these shows have contributed absolutely nothing to society. For every Duck Dynasty, there's probably 10 shows that only lasted two or three episodes and then never saw the light of day again. But there was one other show that came out during this time uh, that did prove to be pretty popular. And that show is called, What Would You Do? And basically the idea of the show is, there are these actors who play out some sort of situation where somebody finds themselves in trouble. Somebody is in need, uh, but the catch of the show is there are these hidden cameras set up all throughout the place to see how real life people would respond to these situations. These people have no idea they're being recorded. They have no idea it's a TV show. And if you watch any of these clips on YouTube, what you will find is there are always three or four people who see what's going on and they are willing to jump in and offer the help for the person in need. And if you read the comments on these videos, you will see that everybody praises these people for doing the right thing. But when you watch these videos, you'll see there's another group of people. There's another group of people who see what's happening and rather than addressing the situation, they just keep their head down, turn around and walk the other way not wanting to be bothered by what's going on. And if you read the comments on these videos, I guarantee you in the sea of all of these comments praising those who do the right thing, you are not gonna find anybody who says, you know, I'll be honest with you for a sec, if I were in that situation, I also probably would've just walked away. And why is that? Why does nobody want to admit that? because deep down we would all like to think that if the camera was pointed at us, we would always be willing to step in and offer the relief when somebody needed it. <clears throat> now in Ruth's time, they don't have hidden cameras set up, but we are going to see here how Boaz responds to a similar situation. So if you have your copy of God's word, would you turn with me to Ruth chapter four? Ruth chapter four is where we're going to be, and as you're turning there, just to set the scene for where we're going to be at today, remember, in Ruth chapter 3, we left with a question. We left wondering who is actually going to be the one to redeem Ruth. Is it going to be Boaz, this guy that seems to have this great connection with Ruth? Or is it going to be this other guy we hear about, this closer redeemer, this closer relative, who has the first right in redeeming Ruth and taking her in marriage? Ruth tells Naomi about the experience uh, she had with Boaz in chapter 3, and Naomi says, Boaz isn't going to rest until this matter gets settled today. So how is it going to get taken care of? Let's find out. Ruth chapter 4, starting in verse 1. The text says, Now Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there. So immediately, Boaz does not waste a single moment. He is so concerned with Ruth and Naomi's welfare that he goes straight to the gates. He goes straight to the gates where everyone would be coming and going on their way to work in the field that day. Because he knows this is probably where this other guy is going to show up. And we don't have to wait long for this guy either to come. Because if you look again, the very next sentence in verse 1, it says, Behold, the Redeemer of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, Turn aside, friend sit down here. And so Naomi was right. This matter is going to get settled today. And so Boaz hasn't wasted a single moment. He's there at the gate. Uh, he has found the other redeemer, but not only is he going about doing this, seeking to uh, resolve it as soon as he can, but he is so concerned with Ruth and Naomi that he wants to make sure everything that is about to happen here is legit. So he goes straight to the gates not just because he knows that's where he's going to find the Redeemer, but it's because it's at the gate that all of the official business and legal matters would be taken care of. 
because you would have all these witnesses who would be able to testify about what had just happened. And not only that, but in verse 2, he calls for uh, 10 elders of the city and he tells them to come and sit down here. So he's got the elders who are going to come and witness this event as well. They're basically going to be the notary who signs off and authorizes and approves of all of this whole situation. And so Boaz has everything set up. He's at the gate. He's got the other redeemer. He's got witnesses. He's got the elders. Now all he has to do is tell the other redeemer about the situation. But before we get into his proposal, I want you to notice something about the text here. He says in verse 3, Boaz said to the Redeemer. Now, if you're reading closely here, you'll notice something. You'll notice that three times already in chapter 4, and once again earlier in chapter 3, this guy's been referred to, yet the author hasn't given us a name. Which is interesting. Because up until this point, the author has made sure that we are given the name of every major character in the story. And so we're left wondering, why hasn't the author given him a name? I mean, if this guy is potentially going to be the one to marry and redeem Ruth, shouldn't his name be pretty, pretty important to us? I mean, maybe is Boaz just being rude to this guy and not calling out for his name? That's probably not the case, because that goes against everything we've seen about his character leading up to this point. Did Boaz just forget his name? Again, probably not. Because Boaz tells Ruth about this person. He's one of his relatives, and he recognizes him when he's at the gate. And so this embarrassing trend is going to continue throughout the rest of the story. And we're going to find out why in a moment. But first, he tells the other redeemer about what's going on. He says, look, Naomi has come back from Moab. Her husband, our relative, has passed away, and she needs to sell the land to take care of herself. In verse 4, I thought I would tell you of it and say, buy it in the presence of the elders of, of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you'll redeem it, great, redeem it. But if you will not, tell me that I may know, for there is no one besides you to redeem it, and I come after you. So once again, we get a glimpse of Boaz's character in this situation. Because if Boaz was only interested in the land, if he just wanted to take the land for himself and take those profits and add those to his estate, he had the perfect opportunity to do so here. It's going on the time of the judges. Everyone is doing what he and, what he and she thinks is right in their own eyes. This would have fit in with the culture. And if he wanted to take the land for himself, he could have done that without this other redeemer ever having known what was going on. Because he has to tell him the situation. But more than his own profit, more than adding to his own estate, he is most concerned with Ruth and Naomi. But if you're the other redeemer and you hear this, you're intrigued. You're thinking, okay, I can redeem this land. I can take some of these profits, add that to my estate. And not only that, but I'm going to be seen as a pretty honorable guy in town because I'm doing all of this for a widow in my family which is why he says at the end of verse 4, okay, I'll redeem it. But just like all of the great infomercials we see late at night, Boaz says, but wait, there's more. <laughs> Boaz said, the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth, the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. So now this complicates things for the other redeemer. Because now, if he redeems the land, he is also responsible to redeem Ruth and perpetuate the name of her dead husband. And how would this happen? Two ways. One, he's supposed to marry Ruth and provide sons for her. Because at this time, what families were most concerned with is making sure the family line would not end in that generation. And so if there are no sons, there is no more family to last, to go past that generation. And so what this guy will need to do is come to Ruth, provide kids for her, specifically sons, 
but not so that his name, not so that his family could continue, but so that Ruth's first husband's family line would continue. Not only that, but he would have to give the inheritance. The other way the family line could be insured was by the giving of the father's inheritance to his children. But in situations like Ruth's, where she has no kids and her husband has passed away, this guy will need to marry Ruth, give kids to her, and take his estate, take his inheritance, and give it to whatever kids that he has with Ruth, but once again, not for the sake of his own name, not for the sake of his family line being passed down, but for the sake of Ruth's dead husband's name. And so this guy hears all of it, and he says, so you're telling me I have to marry this foreign Moabite woman if I redeem the field. I have to provide for her. I have to take care of her. And not even for my name, but for the name of someone else. This guy sees Ruth as a threat to his own inheritance. Which is why he says in verse 6, I can't redeem it for myself. And what's the reason? Lest I impair my own inheritance. This guy is not willing to risk his inheritance in order to make sure that Ruth and Naomi are properly taken care of. And so he ends up taking his sandal off, gives it to Boaz, says, you redeem her. Because he gives the, the sandal to him. It's basically like us signing the dotted line at the end of a contract, setting in stone what we had just agreed for. And just like that, this other redeemer who is so concerned with his, his own inheritance and making sure that his name is the name that is passed down, because he is not willing to redeem Ruth, ends up walking away from the scene himself without a name. But Boaz, on the other hand, is willing to redeem her. And so he says in verse 9, to all the elders and all the people, you are witnesses this day that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Kilion and to Malon. So he offers to Naomi complete and total redemption. He is willing to redeem everything that is necessary to make sure Naomi is taken care of. But not only that, verse 10, Ruth the Moabite the widow of Malon, I have bought to be my wife, to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of his native place. So he looks at Ruth, the foreign Moabite woman, and he says, I know if I come and redeem her, that might mean that my family line, my name might end at this generation, but I am willing to come and redeem her because she is made in the image of God and she needs that protection and he is willing to step in and offer that to her. And so Ruth goes from being a poor, vulnerable widow to now she gets to enjoy the love safety and security of being loved by Boaz, being married to him, being loved by a guy who loves her and loves the Lord. And the people give a blessing to Ruth and, I, to, to Ruth and Boaz. And verse 11, all the people were at the gate and the elders said, we are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. So they say to Ruth, Ruth, may the Lord make your house just like the matriarchs of Israel, just like the mothers of the tribes of Israel. She is given a place with the matriarchs of Israel. So now not only has this poor, vulnerable widow gone to being a, a wife of Boaz, she has gone from, she's, now, she's been a poor, vulnerable, foreign widow, to now she is a beloved bride who is given a place with the matriarchs of Israel. And they say, they call out to Boaz. May you act worthily in Ephrathah and be renowned in Bethlehem. And may your house be like the house of Perez. 
whom Tamar bore to Judah. They say, Boaz, because you were willing to put your name and your inheritance and your family line on family line at the line for Ruth, may your name and your house, just like Perez has lasted for generations and has served as a blessing, may your house do the same. All because Boaz was willing to do whatever was necessary to redeem Ruth and take care of Naomi. And if the story ended here, we would think this was a great happily ever after moment. But there is still only one more problem here. And that is, it doesn't seem like Ruth and Boaz are able to have kids. Because remember in chapter 3, Boaz told Ruth, look, there are younger guys you could have gone after. Not only that, Ruth appears to be barren up to this point. There are no kids mentioned with her in chapter 1. She doesn't bring anyone with her to Israel. And so how then can, uh, can Ruth be given a place with the matriarchs? How then can Boaz's name, his, can his house last for generations if they themselves are not even able to have a kid? Because at the end of verse 12, you'll see how. Because of the offspring that the Lord will give you by this young woman. So while it was Boaz who was willing to accomplish the work of redemption for Ruth, it's been the father who's been the one who is at work this entire time behind the scenes, and it's the father who is the one who's going to make sure that this blessing is secure for Ruth and Boaz. And once again, immediately we see that he is back at work. Because in verse 13, Boaz took Ruth, she became his wife, and immediately he went into her, and the Lord gave her conception. And she bore a son. So now, not only has Ruth gone from being a poor, vulnerable, foreign widow in a place that she did not grow up in, she has gone from being a poor, vulnerable, foreign widow who has no kids who is barren, to now... She's beloved by Boaz. She's given a place with the matriarchs, and she gets to enjoy the blessing of having a son for her own. And then look at how blessed Naomi becomes. They say, blessed be the Lord in verse 14, who has not left you this day without a redeemer, and may his name be renowned in Israel. He's going to be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. And then notice in verse 16, Naomi took the child, laid him on her lap, and became his nurse. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born, but not to Ruth. A son's been born to Naomi. So now Naomi has also gone where she was in a place where she was in a foreign land in Moab, where she went through the pain of losing not just her husband, not just one of her sons, but both of her sons, to now she is back in her homeland, and she gets to enjoy the same relationship with her grandson that a mother gets to share with her very own son. All because the father has been at work this entire time, and Boaz was willing to step in and join the father in this work and redeem Ruth and Naomi. The father's been at work the entire time throughout the story. It wasn't a coincidence that Boaz just so happened to be related to Naomi. And it wasn't a coincidence that Ruth just so happened to be gleaning in the fields of Boaz and catch Boaz's eye. And it wasn't a coincidence that the closer redeemer just so happened to show up the moment Boaz went to the gate. None of those were by accident. It's because the Father has been moving throughout the, the entire story, behind the scenes, throughout all of Ruth, to bring Ruth and Naomi to a place where they could be redeemed by Boaz. And because Boaz was willing to step in and redeem them, the situation they found themselves in in chapter 1 has been completely and totally reversed. Because Boaz was willing to join the Father in what he was doing. And this heart, this heart that is willing to step in, no matter what the cost might be, is the heart God wants his people to have. 
when Israel would read Ruth, God wants Israel to see that just as Boaz dealt with Ruth, so he has dealt with them. That just like Ruth was a poor and vulnerable widow in a foreign land with no one to take care of her, with no ability to get out of that situation herself, so they too were in a foreign land in Egypt, were poor, were vulnerable, couldn't take care of themselves, but God was willing to come and redeem them, set them free so that they can enjoy the blessings that only the Father can give as they enter into the promised land, but more importantly, into that covenant relationship with him. But the problem for us is, too often, we just simply are not willing to do what Boaz did. The issue is oftentimes we want to make it about our ability. We think we're not qualified. We think we don't have the ability, but that's not the issue because we today have something even greater to offer than Boaz ever did. We have the message of Christ. And it's not even about us being the ones who are redeeming people. It's about us taking that message to tell them that Jesus has already accomplished the, the, Jesus has already accomplished redemption because of what he did on the cross for you if you would turn and believe in him. And so when the Father has so orchestrated events where people come into our lives so that we can take this message of redemption to them and we let it go by, it's not because of our ability. It's because like the other Redeemer, we're just not willing. Our church in Weatherford, here in Parker County, finds ourselves in a unique situation where since the pandemic, um, there have been more people moving into our county from out of state than any other county in Texas, more, more so than Austin, more so than Houston, more so than Dallas, here into Weatherford. But oftentimes, our attitude with these people is not that the Father has so orchestrated events so that they could come here and we can give them this message of redemption. Oftentimes our attitude is, I wish they just would have never come here in the first place because they're going to mess with our town. They're going to vote for the wrong people. And if they would just stay away, if we would just get them to leave, then everything would be okay. But when this is our heart and this is our attitude, we are not sharing the attitude of Boaz. We have the same attitude as that other redeemer who looked at Ruth and said, my inheritance isn't worth giving up for you. But thank God this is not how he dealt with us. That Christ was willing to go to the cross for us and spill his blood so that we can be brought back to the Father, enjoy that same secure, protected, loving relationship, the blessings that only he can give throughout eternity. And that we can go, and just as Israel was to go towards the foreigner, towards the widow, so that they can come, take this redemption, so that they can be brought into the family of God, we are called to do the same. And so it's not a matter about whether or not we have the ability. The question is, are you simply willing? If Christ was willing to go to the cross for us, how can we not be willing to take his message to others? And so the question for us to ask today, are you going to be like Boaz? Or are you going to be like the other Redeemer? Or all the people on the TV show who decide they're going to turn around and not be bothered by what's going on? Let's pray. Father, thank you that you were willing to do something about our situation and redeem us by giving us your son. So Jesus, just as you were sent, you send us out. So may we also be willing to take the message of your redemption to our neighborhoods, to our families, to our state, and to all the nations so that others just like Ruth and Naomi experienced a complete reversal in their circumstance, may these people also experience a complete change in their condition 
where they can enjoy the family and blessing that only you provide, Father. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.